So today we're going to be discussing the donor's perspective about giving a kidney. So we have my brother Desmond here today from Performance Destination and he's going to tell us his views but my husband will be the person facilitating this. So he'll be asking some questions and we're going to go ahead and answer it. First question would be why did you decide to be a donor? Because me, me deciding the fact of being a donor was the deciding effect of saving of saving someone's life. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and at the same time, it's just not anybody. It's family. It's my sister. It's not something that you question or you you you, you wonder about. You just you just got to do what you have to do for family. Yeah, you know, he was a match instantly. My dad was a match. Not too much my mom, but they were my match. But my brother is healthier than my dad, and so we just figured it would just it would be better for the family. Okay. So the next question will be Did you do any research? And if so, um what kind of research did you do before the um surgery? I did no research. Not one research at all. I knew I knew what she needed and that was that I'm, I was always in from the jump. I don't need to do research on it. Research means that I'll be questioning things. So if I question it, that means I'm questioned to see if I want to do this, if I didn't want to do this. I was all in as soon as I was able to do it. So there was no need, no need to do any research about it. That's really touching. That's really touching. Okay, so um, while leading up to the, to the surgery, um, as things get closer, you start doing labs and all that stuff, and the time getting closer, um, were you starting to get scared, um, having second thoughts of backing out? Um, what's your thought on that? Well, I was never scared from the time where they said I could be in choice of donating, the time I did labs, the time all that led up to the morning where I had to say goodbye to everybody. I was never scared. I was more of excited so we could finally get the journey started and get this journey over with. Well, really the beginning of the journey, but to get that stuff going. So I was never really scared, you know? So I was just more ready. I already knew for sure what I wanted to do. Okay. So if I was scared, that would have mean I was hesitant. Okay, okay. Now, a lot of people reach out to you. What are some of the things that they reach out to you about and like, what have you said to them? Well, a lot of people, you know, everybody, I'm talking about worldwide, nationwide. Everybody reached out to me just to congratulate me. At the same, for what I did was a proud act, a selfish act. Um, what I did was good, you know. But a lot of people who who are also in the same situation or in similar situations, they talk to me and ask me questions because them them too is kind of curious about doing the same procedure or going through the same situation with their own family member. So. You know, and me being a donor, I already knew firsthand before being a donor and after a donor what needed to be done in the process of it. So people ask me, people who had kidney disease, uh, lupus, and other things of a similar nature, you know, they, they wanted to know how your body feel afterwards, how do you feel afterwards, how the, how the, your sister is gonna feel afterwards, you know, about They're scared. living with one, one, one kidney. But you know, a lot of people are born with one kidney. A lot of people don't know that either. Yeah. People are born with one kidney. So those who are born with one kidney live their whole life, 70, 80, 90 years old with one kidney. You know, it, me with one kidney, living a life healthy, I'd be the same. So you mentioned that um, people ask you, your, um, how do you feel after the surgery? So how do you feel after the surgery? Do your body, does your body feel different? Anything like that? No, 
my body feels right now. Oh, right now as I sit, I'm probably two weeks in after surgery. And right now as I sit, I feel pretty, pretty close to seeing exactly how I feel before I went into surgery. I have my, I have my surgery, surgery scars, you know, where they cut me open and um, that's healing. That part, I feel that part for a little, a little bit. I felt it a lot when I first, when I first woke up from surgery, but this part, you know, how I feel right now, I feel pretty normal. You know, I feel a little more tired at times, you know, maybe I think it's because I have so much downtime of recovery. Doctor won't let me do nothing. Doctor won't let me drive myself places. I can't lift anything. So I feel a little bit more tired because I'm doing a lot more recovering than I've ever, I ever did in my life. So, you don't know how to stay still. So, so it makes you a little bit more tired, a little more sleepy. But physical, physical, like I feel like I have my, my health and my strength back. So I feel like a normal, like, like my normal self before surgery. Okay, so what are some things that the doctors say you can't do? Well, they don't want you living or lifting over 10 pounds. The heaviest they want you to lift is a milk carton. The weight of a milk carton, mm -hmm. that's one thing. You can't put any strain on yourself because you know, you may open up your, Decision. your decisions. Yeah. Um, you can't drive. <clears throat> For me, I haven't been on medication. I haven't been on medication since the second day uh, from the hospital. Wow. So I got off medications and painkillers and, and all the things they put you on. I got that off. I got off of that by the second day. So a lot of people they stay on that because they have to deal with the pain longer. So they can't drive because the medications in your system. And if you're driving, you get pulled over. I was advised if you you get pulled over on a cop with that stuff in your system. That's considered a DUI, oh, and you wow. can also lose your driver's license from that. So I think that's why he told me I couldn't drive for that meantime. But you but, feel like you could drive. Yeah, I feel like I can drive. I feel like I can, I can go back to racing my cars. <laughs> so I feel like I'm good now. But I couldn't do that for the meantime because of that's his procedure step. So, so how long did they tell you you can't drive for? I can't drive for four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. So okay. I'm already. Tomorrow makes it my second. No, tomorrow makes it my second weekend. Yeah. And I just have two more weeks. Then I can back to regular operating my cars, my race cars, my race team, and I can go back to it. But um, but for four weeks I have to be down with no driving. So I have a lot of family and people in my surroundings to help assist me. So uh, to get me from point A to point B. Okay, now through all this process, um, do you have any regrets? There's no regrets. I just, I stand here feeling exactly how I felt before I went in. So if I feel the same as when I, before I went in, what's the regret, you know? I feel perfectly fine and I put, I put life into another person so they could feel perfectly fine. So it's not to say, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna be dragging my feet and crawling up the bed and crawling up, you know, feeling like I'm like I'm down on life. Like I feel just as, I feel fine, you know? I'm I'm always active, I exercise, I run. I feel like I feel like I could kinda get back into it right now if I wanted to. So I don't feel like, you know, I regret anything because to give another person life, you know, that's that's more beautiful than anything. So I have a question. Um to my give another person life. How did it make you feel to see me go through all of that? To see me go through dialysis, to see me have you know major weight loss, to see me lose my hair, just to be weak, can't really spend time with my family, can't travel, just my whole life upside down. How did that make you feel as my brother? Well, you know, me as your brother, family, sibling, Anybody really, you know, both our parents, all of our siblings, aunts, uncles, and myself, we all looked at it, you know, it was emotional. Sometimes it was sad news to hear this and sad news to hear this. Good news when she's feeling better, but, you know, it, it puts you down. It makes you feel, it makes you feel like, you know, when is it going to get better? Is it ever going to get better? Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't realize before this surgery, um, probably at least two years ago, you know, I've always been, for the past two years straight actually, I've been praying that if God would let me sacrifice myself to save her life, you know, or do whatever I have to do to sacrifice to save her life. You know, and, I, and for the past two years, I didn't see any signs, you know, until this, until just last year, when she had told us she made the kidney donor list. And once she made that list, 
those are the signs that started rolling through. And that's when I knew God was working. So what was your, throughout the whole process, what's your m most memorable part of it? The most memorable part, for myself, my, for me, myself only, for my part first, would be the time when I first woke up and then the time I was, I was, I was able to get out of bed for the first time. Didn't know what it was gonna be like. Didn't know, I, I felt the pain. I felt the, 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 the medicine wearing off. So I didn't know if I'd get on my two feet if I was gonna fall, if I was gonna stand strong, if I was gonna stumble. But I actually got on my feet, you know, and um, that felt good. And that's just for me. But the most memorable whole thing as a whole for the whole surgery was when she started eating fine. She started, um, mm -hmm. body started functioning fine. Where her kidney results <laughs> was actually looking better than my kidney <laughs> results. And then eventually it worked down to we had nearly the same, same. kidney results yeah. so at a normal level. And then we both took our first walk lap around our victory lap inside the building. So it shows and we shake the bell. <laughs> so it shows that, you know, sometimes you go through a rough patch and there's always a brighter side on the other side. Yeah. Now you going through all of this, what would you say to somebody that's out there that's thinking about doing donating to a family member or a friend, um, what message do you have to say to them? You gotta do it. And you gotta do it out of love because yeah. the pain that you'll go through when you wake up and then the, re the road to recovery of that short first week, it's tough, it hurts, you know? But temporary pain is temporary. Yeah. So a lifetime of beauty for a little bit of temporary pain, you can't even measure up to it. So if you're gonna do it, I say you would do it. And if someone needs it, be the one to step up to do it. Because not everybody in this world is, will step up for you, will do stuff like that, will cut themselves open to take an organ out of you to give to the next person. So if you have someone that wants to do it, then you know I applause to that. Because at the same time, you know, saving someone's life is big. You know, we don't create life. I don't create life, you know? So if I had the opportunity to save someone's life, that's a big moment in my, for my life. Yeah. Okay. But I have another um, question for you as well. Can you explain the process that you had to go through from the beginning? Like, okay, I said, hey, I'm on the donor's list. What did you have to do? If you can explain, because people want to know the background of Okay, what do I have to do? Do I have to go to a, a website? Do I have to go into a hospital? You know, what kind of tests would they do on me? And you know, if you could kind of explain, if you remember. Start to finish? Start to finish. <laughs> All right, so start to finish. So when, you, when the process, after you join the list, now they the one to accept to see if, if the test results are starting to match up. So me, my mom, and my dad, we all had to do urine samples. So we did a urine sample. I think it was a 24-hour urine sample. Yeah, it was. And we had to pee in, we had to pee in this jar for 24 hours and keep it refrigerated. And that was the first step. Send that up, send that off. They they sample that, and um, and then when it comes back for future testing, then we'll move forward. So then they come down to the point where after they got that results, they show that my my levels were looking good, cholesterol, my sugar, my kidney. A lot of things start looking good, so they now they want to. So they did blood work too. They did blood work too. Okay. You have to do your blood work when you go there to drop off the urine. They do the blood work as well. So after you match up, you can only have okay. Say if all three of us was a match, but you can only select one person, and then there's also a backup person. So I was I was the main person, and my father was the backup person. Um, then you fly. You, fl they, you fly to the facility of Emory here in Atlanta, Georgia, and they test you in their actual labs. And when I say they test you, they test you. I went through, every, I went through everything. <laughs> so much blood. I mean, I we had like everything. 20 containers of blood. I went through a lot of blood samples. They pulled a lot of blood out of my, out of my body that day. Yeah. And a lot of urine samples. Um, they also tested me for lupus because if I had lupus, they didn't want to pull a kidney out of me to give to another lupus. Um, person yeah so but everything came back perfect like like perfect perfect I did cat scans I did special x-rays I did 
numerous, when I say numerous, I'm talking about numerous amount of blood being drawn out of both arms because they was tapping so much on one side, they had to tap the other side. So they went through really, really, really detailed steps start to finish to actually make sure that you are a good match for her. And then the results came. And then that thing takes about, maybe it took about a few weeks. Yeah. It took for me those results to come back. And then once those results come back, then they told me that I was a match and then I had to coordinate yeah. when I wanted to, to do the surgery. Oh, when then schedule my own, my own date. Yeah. So we did that. And, um, and we did it for new, we did it for the month of January, you know, yeah, 2020. right after all the holidays. Yeah. I had, I, we had a lot of family functions before, before January. So we wanted to make sure we get that all out the way and yeah. where nobody's recovering or anything like that. So we started off the year, you know, wow. through surgery, yeah. you know, and, um, and the month is not even up yet and I'm ready back to my normal self. So we're going to continue the rest of the year even stronger, but they take you, they take you through steps and they want to make for sure, for sure that you are a candidate for that person you're about to give that kidney to. Um, they even do like kidney samples to make sure the condition of your kidney is good to give the next person because we can't give, you can't give a hurt or a low functioning kidney to the next person who needs it. Mm -hmm. Luckily enough, my kidney came back stronger than than they told me about the, any that they ever seen. You know, as soon as my kidney was put in her body, oh wow, the, res <laughs> the results came back more more shocking than they than they said they ever seen. They said they had never seen a kidney transplant this successful before. So, and I'm pretty proud. I'm pretty happy for Emery and their whole staff and what they did for both of us, for yeah. the whole family. We're forever grateful. They did an awesome job. Well, any last words before we end the video? Anything? Um, there is something I do want to say as well. I know there's a lot of people out there that are scared. They are nervous. Or people might say, you know what? Financially, I just can't do that. I can't take off time. I can't take off you no know, four to eight weeks of work. And I just can't afford to do it. Well, I just want you to know that don't let that be a factor because there's help out there. Um, some organizations are willing to help you, you know, pay your bills or your travel expenses, even down to hotels and food or whatever you may need for that process because they don't want you to be stressed while thinking about giving um, a kidney. So there are things out there, so don't ever let that be a factor that you don't have the funds to give a kidney because you can't take time off from work. Right. Yeah. But the biggest thing is, you can't let that be a factor of saving someone's life. So if your mom, your dad, your brother, your son, your daughter, they need a kidney to keep their life going, a piece of paper of a bill that needs to be paid, or a water bill that needs to be paid, or a cell phone bill that needs to be paid, you can't even measure up to somebody keeping that person's life alive. Money can't measure up life. Money can't measure up love. Yeah. You know, so God always been with me. So I've always been blessed. Everything I have, I got it through God. I've always been blessed. I don't worry about a lot of things because I know God always provides. So financially, I already prepared myself for it way before this, this happened. So I was able to take care of my bills and handle everything. But if I wasn't prepared for it, money is money. It comes and goes. People get broke one day and they're rich the next. Yeah. But you can't, once someone passes away, you can't bring them back. So there's really no deciding factor of of that when saving someone's life. Amen. And on that note, I just want to thank my brother for just coming out here and telling you guys his perspective um, for being a donor. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome.